normally when we think about carbon or calcium or sulfur or oxygen, they seem to be rather distant, dead mechanical objects, really, that we can't relate to at all. You know, very small, very insignificant individually. And, um, like billiard balls? Yeah, like billiard balls that are interact, but they don't, not fundamentally changed by their interactions. In other words, it's dead things. And it's very hard for us to relate to them and therefore to the Earth because they're so cr critical for the Earth, particularly carbon. So what I've done in, in my book, Animate Earth, is to speak of the chemical elements as personalities. Um, and I've studied them very carefully, chemically, to see what those personalities might be like. Because for me, you see, everything, um, everything is animate. There's nothing that's in inanimate at all. Everything is animate. Everything is full of experience and sentience. Um, following Father Thomas Berry, I would say, um, like him, that the earth is not a collection of objects, but a communion of subjects. So the old mechanistic worldview is that the world is a collection of objects, these billiard balls we talked of earlier. But what if the earth is more like a communion of subjects? In other words, everything has subjectivity, even atoms and molecules, in which case carbon, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, should all have their own personalities. And I tried to find out what those were by studying the properties of those elements. And I came to the conclusion that ox oxygen is like the passionate Italian of the chemical world. That it just loves to engage in fiery, passionate relationships with the other chemical elements. And that um, carbon is like the cooperative Swede of the chemical world. It just loves to make alliances with many other carbons to make huge long chains of carbon. We call these organic molecules. That calcium is a, a very dynamic princess that loves to get things going and get people excited in the chemical world. So that's what I've done in Animate Earth. And I've uh, developed a version of one of the carbon cycles, the long-term carbon cycle in that book, which retells the cycle uh, in more animistic language. Well, carbon and carbon dioxide, according to this story, become animated personalities. For example, for me, carbon is actually like a prince. A, I should have said a Swedish prince. A very cooperative Swedish prince. And he's in the atmosphere with his two oxygen courtiers in, in a carbon dioxide molecule. And he's dying, he's seen the world, seen everything. He's seen the insides of plants, he's been inside animals, in and out of the ocean many, many times and he's dying for some kind of stability. Meanwhile, in certain rocks like granite and basalt, um, there lives imprisoned, if you like, the calcium princess. How does this relate to carbon emissions and, and, oh. and the trouble we have now with fossil fuels? Ah, well, uh, I suppose you could say that we're, as we said earlier, we're just liberating too much of the carbon that's, that was kept out of the atmosphere by this guy and process I'm describing. I can go into it if you like, or maybe you don't want me to. So this is the way the Earth kind of removes carbon from the atmosphere? Yes, this is, the, this is the main way in which... Remember I said earlier that most of the carbon that was in the atmosphere is now in the form of limestone and chalk. This is the way that that carbon finds its way into limestone and chalk. Because mm -hmm. the chemical formula for chalk and limestone is Ca, calcium, C, carbon O3. In English you call it calcium carbonate. So three of the chemical elements. The Ca is the, is the princess, mm -hmm. uh, C the carbon is the prince, and oxygen is the passionate Italian. And they're all there together in this chalk. So the question is how does the carbon get into the chalk? How does it get into this relationship with calcium and oxygen? Mm -hmm. Well, the story begins with the prince and his two courtiers zooming around in the atmosphere. Um, and he's dying to find his calcium princess, but she is locked deep inside granite and basalt rocks in this crystalline lattice, like it's inside the granite castle, if you like. And so they need a priest to marry each other, and of course the priest is water, rainwater. But unlike human priest that goes home after the marriage, this, this chemical priest, the water, gets completely involved in the marriage. The three of them sort of get together and what's released is um, hydrogen, little hydrogen beings that are so small they sneak their way into the granite castle. They go under doorways, so to speak, 
through little cracks under windows, and they find uh, they tri they sort of trip past the little the guards. You can imagine these huge, great chemical guards in the rock, in the rock guarding the, the rock entrances, the rocky entrances to the castle. The hydrogen is so small; it's like a flea. It just gets goes between their feet, and they don't notice. But the hydrogen has got a positive charge, and this positive charge interferes with the electrical attractions in the rock, and it begins to dissolve, liberating the calcium, the princess. And she can then get together with carbon in the carbon dioxide. And this, rough, very roughly speaking, is how they, the chalk is made. Actually, what's made is a solution of chalk, not solid chalk. And this solution of chalk is washed down to the rivers. This is the long-term carbon cycle, which regulates the Earth's temperature on geological timescales. And it's the process that will eventually remove the carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere in about 200 to 300,000 years' time. So it's terribly important. It could be what's going to rescue Gaia in the long run. So this sweet Swedish prince is actually uh, really needs to get into that rock. Yeah, he needs to get into the rock. It's a very slow process, of, as I've just said. It takes two, two to three, two hundred to three hundred thousand years. Slow from our point of view, but quite fast from Gaia's point of view. So once the prince and the princess have been washed by the rivers into the oceans, there. Little marine algae, in fact, the same ones that produce the cloud seeding gas, mm -hmm. uh, but also the corals or the crabs or any creatures that make chalky skeletons absorb the uh, chalk solution, make solid chalk, and when those beings die, their bodies sink to the bottom of the ocean, making vast deposits of chalk and limestone. And that's how the carbon uh, prints gets out of the atmosphere. But then you might ask, what, what happens if this process goes on very effectively? Couldn't it cool the Earth to death? And that is indeed a great danger. We need just the right amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Too much and we boil to death, too little and we freeze to death, you see. Now this is the amazing, it's amazing how Gaia has been able to know, so to speak, what the right amount of carbon dioxide is at any given moment. So, as you say, if too much is taken out. If too many of those carbon princes find themselves in the limestone chalk rock, the Earth will freeze to death. So why, why hasn't that happened? Well, because the great movements of the Earth's plates, plate tectonics that we referred to earlier, actually uh, conspire to subduct some of that chalk and limestone deep beneath the continent, um, at a continental margin, because they lie on top of the basalt rock which is coming up from below and moving sideways. Remember, we mentioned this earlier. That rock, basalt rock carries on top of it the chalk and limestone. And when the, all of that meets a continent, it gets pushed down underneath. And there, the temperatures are so intense and the pressures are so intense that basically the chalk melts and the CO2, the carbon dioxide prints, returns to the atmosphere through volcanoes. And that saves the day. If it weren't for volcanoes, the carbon will end up at the bottom of the sea. Uh, as chalk and limestone, and the earth would freeze to death. But how's the balance here, Harding? Is it uh, when we release now fossil carbon atoms into the atmosphere, doesn't this increase the pace at which these Swedish princes you're talking about are sucked down into the ground? It does, but remember, it's terribly slow. It's a terribly slow process. So imagine we were to capture a CO2 molecule in the room right now. You've got one here, you know, sort of thrumming in between my fingertips, right? Can you see it? Now I'm going to mark it with a little blue pen and then release it. Now what's, what's it going to do? Well, it'll zoom around in the room for a while and then when somebody opens the door, it'll find its way out of the door and then eventually when someone opens the window, it'll go into the air. And then it might go into a plant where underneath through a little pore on the underside of a leaf and it might stay there for maybe a year or less. Or it might stay there, might get into the wood, it might stay there for 300 years. But eventually it'll be returned to the atmosphere. 